Hi everyone and welcome to the chapter 9 lecture for microbiology and this chapter is a shorter one so um, it's all about the physical and chemical control of microbes so this chapter is really about um, a kind of focused on how we keep microbes off of surfaces and the next chapter and and also off off of the surfaces of our body so like hands and hand washing whereas the next chapter is more about how do we, how do we treat infections um so drug therapies all right so when it comes to controlling microbes in our environment in our surroundings there are this this chart here is sort of like a cheat sheet overview of all the different methods. So there are physical agents that we can use. We'll talk about heat, dry heat versus moist heat. Moist heat is better, it's faster. Um, also radiation is a, is a physical agent that we can use to kill bacteria, whether it be like x-rays or gamma irradiation, which is ionizing radiation, or UV radiation. Um, there are different chemical agents we can use. There are sterilizing gases, and there are also various liquids, and that's usually what we use in our sort of everyday lives, different, different liquids for either antisepsis on our bodies um, or for disinfecting surfaces around us. And then there's also mechanical removal methods, and these are often used for products, for production of vaccines or, um, I don't know, just lots of products. <laughs> um, filtration of air, so like HVAC, um, HVAC filters are very pertinent right now and making sure that air filtration systems are, are good to prevent transmission of um, SARS-CoV-2. And also we can do filtration of liquids. So there's also on this slide a distinction between some of the terminology in the area of controlling microbes. So we've got disinfection, sterilization, antisepsis, and decontamination. Four words that most often, you know, like colloquially, like laymen use them kind of interchangeably, but technically they have different definitions. So in disinfection, um, we're talking about surfaces, so we're not, we wouldn't say that we disinfect a person. Um, let's start with, let's actually start with antisepsis. So antisepsis is what we do to a person. So our skin, um, antisepsis is washing your hands. It's treating a, um, the site of an injection with an alcohol swab before injecting. Um, those are things to destroy potential pathogens that are on living surfaces. So antisepsis, because you're treating living cells, they need to be of the gentler non-toxic variety, right? So you don't wanna harm yourself. A lot of chemicals that are used for sterilization, disinfection are not safe for human use. Like for example, you cannot drink bleach to as an antisepsis or personal disinfection technique, okay? <clears throat> but you can use bleach on surfaces. So the difference between disinfection and sterilization is that disinfection kills most, but not all bacteria. So it removes most pathogens, but not all of them. Um, so when you spray your, you know, um, like a lot of, a lot of surface cleaners are disinfectants. They remove most, but not necessarily all. Sterilization kills everything. Um, it's complete destruction and removal of all uh, infectious particles. Um, so disinfection is usually sufficient in a lot of instances to reduce your risk of infection like in your house disinfecting surfaces like kitchen surfaces is fine but in a setting like healthcare setting or hospitals where pathogens are rampant and you really want to protect people sterilization is really the standard um okay so when it comes to uh microbes there 
they have varying levels of resistance to these different control mechanisms. And we can rate them and we can talk about some examples. Uh, you don't have to know this whole table, but we will look, look at some of these trends, okay? So the most resistant thing to treatment are prions or prions. Remember, those are the infectious proteins. They're not viruses, but we talked about them in the end of chapter five. They cause spongiform encephalopathy or spongy brain disease. And these are just incredibly heat stable. And there's really nothing you can do to destroy them. They're like indestructible. And so basically you just have to throw stuff away. You can't, you can't sterilize equipment that has been contaminated with prions. Um, bacterial endospores are also very resistant. Remember that's what they're designed for. An endospore is a state that the bacteria goes into when they are trying to resist harsh conditions. So um, bacterial endospores are often used to test products like for example, an autoclave, when it needs to be calibrated, needs to be checked that it's actually sterilizing things, you um, place like a capsule of bacterial endospores in the autoclave, run it, and then check that those endospores are in fact dead. So if the autoclave is killing endospores, then you know it's, it's, up, it's functioning up to par. Um, so these are kind of considered really like the, the standard of, of really tough bugs to kill. Um, protozoan cysts are sort of like bacterial endospores, so they are also pretty tough, but um, not quite as tough. And then you see a variety of different bacteria and fungi listed, you know, along the middle of the spectrum here, and then viruses being somewhat easy to destroy. Um, viruses are either proteins or lipids. Viruses, they can't live outside of a cell, so they have sort of a limited viability outside of a cell, um, so on a surface. Um, and enveloped viruses are easier to get rid of than non-enveloped viruses. Those envelopes are very susceptible to um, lots of things that disrupt lipid membranes and also to um, becoming desiccated and dried out. So uh, that's good news, I suppose, during a viral pandemic with an enveloped virus. Okay, so a couple more vocab terms to know. Um, germicidal or bactericidal or microbicidal versus microbostatic or bacteriostatic or fungistatic. Okay, so that, that suffix side or sidal means to kill. Um, homicide is killing another person. Um, uh, pesticide is, is something you use to kill pests, plant pests or insect pests. So um, that bactericidal or fungicides, those are things that sterilize. They are things that kill. Um, well, I guess they can disinfect too, but they, they, they do that by killing bacteria. Then there are control agents that are microbostatic, which means they don't kill bacteria. They just make it really hard for them to grow well. So it just really slows down their growth. And um, a lot of times that's, you know, that's enough to help control them. So this is uh, my little cartoon here that I stole from Google um, about bacteriostatic versus bactericidal compounds. So antisepsis or asepsis is really the term that we use when we're talking about microbial control on the human body, on the skin, in a clinical setting. All right, so hand washing is a form of antisepsis when you spread iodine or alcohol on the skin at an injection site, that's antisepsis using hand sanitizer. Those are all um, uh, antisepsis or aseptic techniques. Okay, so when we talk about microbicidal things, what does it really mean to kill a bacteria or even kill, kill a virus, all right? Um, so in in human health, in, in bi uh, human biology, you know, 
we define death of a person or of, of an animal as, you know, there's a, a loss of vital signs, no heartbeat, um, no brain activity, okay? But how do you decide if a bacteria is dead? They don't have a heart, they don't have a brain. And so the definition really for death of bacteria is that they no longer are capable of reproducing. Um, so if you take a culture tube and you, you, you know, get a culture loop and you get a sample of that and you spread it on clean media, if nothing grows from that, then the bacteria are dead. Um, if you, so if that tube has been autoclaved or whatever, and it still is, there are still viable bacteria coming out of it, that's, that's sort of the definition there. So it's a permanent loss of the ability to reproduce. And that is how we define dead bacteria because we obviously don't have any kind of vital signs that we can detect. We don't have like a little stethoscope. You know what I mean, <laughs> hopefully. All right, so um, there's lots of things that affect the death rate of microbes in culture so or microbes exposed to these different agents so the first thing is the concentration and duration of exposure so for example bleach um, is a great disinfecting agent okay but if you make a really dilute solution of bleach um, and you spray that on a counter and then you wipe it off right away you're not going to do a very effective job of decontaminating or um, disinfecting the surface as if you use the, you know, a 10% concentration, you know, 30 seconds, a minute or so exposure, or even more than that, you know, five or 10 minutes. All right, so the longer the exposure and the um, more optimal the concentration, the better disinfection you're going to get. So um, that's important. The metabolic activity of cells is important as well. So remember when we talked about the growth of bacteria and culture, we um, get a curve something like this. So there's the lag phase of growth where they're kind of still like metabolically slow, like think they're like just waking up. They're kind of groggy. All right. And then they really get their day going and they start actively reproducing binary fission lots of doubling all right that's the exponential or log phase of growth these guys are super susceptible to chemical agents all right this is the best time to kill bacteria and they get that stationary phase they start to get really crowded and then they start to die or just slow down their metabolic rate and be kind of, you know, like starving and close to death, but not dead. And when they're in that state, they're actually a lot more resistant to um, antimicrobials and to chemical agents. So the best time to get at them is um, when they're really active. Um, the number of microbes is important too. Like there's a difference between if you sneeze um, on the counter versus if you spilled a whole tube of bacteria on the counter, a whole culture tube. Okay, so the, the larger the load of contaminants, the longer it's going to, you're going to need to use a higher concentration and a longer duration to really do a good job destroying those. Um, some other things, it depends, of course, on the identity of the microbe, right? Are you trying to get rid of bacterial endospores or are you trying to get rid of enveloped viruses on a surface? So that will determine which agent you use and for how long. Um, the temperature and pH of the environment are important. Some agents don't act as quickly, like um, in a cold environment, for example, you would need to soak like if you spilled something in your refrigerator, uh, if you have contamination in your refrigerator, you need to let it soak a little bit longer because the colder temperature of the refrigerator makes um, the action, uh, the reaction rate much slower. Um, same thing, the pH of the environment can affect the effectiveness of the cleaning agent. Um, Knowing the mode of action is important. How does it work? And we're going to talk about some of those modes of action. 
And then also just knowing the material, uh, making sure you're using the right disinfectant for the right for the type of material you're trying to disinfect. So for example, um, if you are trying to disinfect um, something with feces in it, okay, just you have to take into account the other molecules that are in feces that might you might need to increase the concentration because because of that, um, you want to make sure that you're not heating, using heat to sterilize things that are going to melt or that are flammable. Um, so the choice of chemical agent is important. So some of the different modes of action of these different chemical agents are they, a lot of them are cell wall disruptors, and this we'll see with antibiotics as well. Um, so they either block the ability of the cell to build the cell wall or they destroy the cell wall. Um, a very common route of a lot of these antimicrobial agents are um, membrane disruptors. So they disrupt the lipid bilayer. Detergents do that. So soaps, um, all kinds of soap, basically, that's how they work. They disrupt the cell membrane. They disrupt your cell membranes too, which is why your hands get kind of dry and flaky and irritated and raw if you wash your hands a lot. Um, but we, of course, are multicellular and our skin has multiple layers of skin cells, including several layers of dead skin cells. So detergents are, you know, very mildly harmful to our surfaces, but, you know, fatal to microbes with lipid membranes. Um, another thing they can do is uh, block synthesis of proteins. Things like um, radiation, they damage DNA, and so they block the ability of the cell to really metabolize and um, make new proteins. Um, and then another really, I would say the, the two most common, eight, like commonly used uh, uh, me methods here of common agents that we all use in our day-to-day -day life are things that disrupt the cytoplasmic membrane and things that disrupt proteins. So heat as a sterilizing agent works by denaturing proteins, so do alcohols. And so I would say detergents, heat, and alcohol are the three most common um, sterilizing and disinfection agents and antisepsis agents. So, um, but others that I'll mention here that I'll point out things like formaldehyde is used a lot of times as a preservative in like medical grade things. Um, ethylene oxide is a gas, it's toxic. So this would not be something you used every day, like your world and your house, but it's sometimes used in industry to, um, and even in hospitals. Okay, so let's talk about heat. Heat is a super common physical method of control. Um, high temperatures will kill bacteria. They are microbicidal. Low temperatures, like cold temperatures, are microbostatic. They inhibit growth. They slow down the growth of the bacteria. So if you have, um, uh, I don't know, a piece of, uh, you have some pizza for dinner, right? And you touch the piece of pizza a lot and you get some bacteria from your hands on the pizza. Okay, if you put that pizza in the refrigerator, all right, that will prevent or slow the growth of the bacteria, but it won't kill the bacteria. If you heat the pizza, um, like if you, if you heat it instead, then you would kill that bacteria. Now, We'll talk later in the course about how you can still get sick even if you kill the bacteria sometimes with foodborne illness, but um, that's the difference between microbicidal and microbostatic. So that's also a reason in terms of food safety why you don't want to like thaw and refreeze, thaw and refreeze, because when you're freezing something, you're not killing bacteria. They're just kind of on pause and every time you thaw it they grow a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more and so it's, it's just not a safe practice um, when it comes to heat there's two types of heat there's moist heat so like steam heat versus dry heat like oven heat 
So moist heat is better at, decon at decontaminating, disinfecting, and sterilizing because of its ability to denature proteins. So the water, the wetness actually um, is hotter actually. So um, using things like an autoclave, autoclave uses steam and pressure. Well, it uses pressure to get water faster and hotter and get the steam hotter. So moist heat you can sterilize in something like three to 15 minutes or boiling water for that matter. All right, dry heat though, like an oven, takes a lot longer time to sterilize. So autoclaves are usually the sterilizer of choice um, in a lot of settings. Also, you can steam heat a lot of things that can resist temperatures of, you know, 120, 130 degrees Celsius in an autoclave. They might not be able to, um, withstand some of the higher temperatures, 160, 170, that are required in, a, in an oven. Um, but ovens are sometimes used for glassware or metal, um, but most of the time autoclaves are the heat sterilizer of choice because again, it's, it's faster. Um, the reason that dry heat, by the way, is, takes longer is because when you dry things and you dehydrate them, dehydration actually preserves proteins to some extent. So you have to go, so the, you know, in the first part of the heating step in dry heat, you're actually dehydrating. And so then you have to keep going. You have to keep heating it until you're actually like frying them. Um, all right. So, uh, Organisms that are most resistant to heat are those that those bacteria that form endospores. Not all bacteria can do that. Um, vegetative cells, which are ones that are actively, basically not that are not endospores that are actively replicating. All right, they vary in their sensitivity, we, just like we saw on that um, original sort of spectrum of of microbes and their different sensitivity or resistance to control mechanisms. So, you know, you'll have some organisms that, you know, they can, you know, a couple of minutes at 50 degrees is enough and others where you need um, a higher heat for longer periods of time. So generally you just kind of like treat everything as if there's endospores and that is sufficient usually to kill everything. If we're talking about like an autoclave. Um, the other thing to make sure, of course, when you're talking about using heat, as a sterilizing agent is that we need to make sure that the material can withstand heat. If the material can't withstand heat, we can't use heat as a way to sterilize it. So plastics, there's, there are plastics that are heat resistant and there are others that are not. Every lab I've ever worked in had some, some piece somewhere on display or hanging from the ceiling or Christmas ornaments or something that were plastic things that people mistakenly put in the autoclave and it came out melted. Um, so you do have to be aware of that. Um, same thing with dry heat. Things that are like wood or plastic should not go in an oven. They will melt. Um, things that are heat sensitive. So like a vaccine, all right? You can't heat sterilize a vaccine because you will denature the components in the vaccine and ruin it. So certain foods you can't heat sterilize because you'll cook it. Um, so if heat will destroy the thing that you're trying to sterilize, it's not an appropriate choice of control. Some of the moist heat methods, boiling water, steam heat using uh, an autoclave, or pasteurization, which is heat, a way that we, that we sterilize a lot of, or we disinfect a lot of liquids in the food industry. So boiling water is oftentimes used in the house uh, for like baby products to sterilize those, though a lot of dishwashers now have um, sterilizing steam heat settings. Um, boiling water, boiling water doesn't get as hot as steam does. 
so steam can get over 100 degrees Celsius, water does not. And so, so water doesn't kill everything. It's not sterilizing. Boiling water is disinfecting. So there are some things that can get can withstand boiling water. So steam heat is, is preferable. Um, autoclaves use steam heat. There are some dishwashers even that can that can sterilize. Um, and pasteurization is a method of usually flash heating. So heating for not, not up to like 100 degrees, but lower temperatures for short periods of time, just enough to kill harmful bacteria. So pasteurization doesn't sterilize. It is not sterilizing. It doesn't kill all bacteria. Milk is pasteurized. Right? And milk still has bacteria, which is why it still spoils after, you know, however many days or weeks. Okay, but it's the main um, reason for pasteurizing it, for heating it, is to kill microbes that are potentially dangerous. Um, so things like salmonella and E. coli, those things would be killed in the pasteurization process. Um, so that's that. Dry heat methods are using flames or ovens. So we use dry heat in the lab when we use a Bunsen burner or an incinerator to sterilize uh, loops for um, doing culture and inoculation. There's also dry ovens in a lot of labs and hospital and clinical settings to cook um, metal or glassware. Um, it uses low heat and longer time. I think ovens might be cheaper and also you can get them larger than autoclave so that might be why some some practices prefer oven versus autoclave it depends on the needs of the facility do they need a quick turnaround or can they just throw everything in an oven at night and leave them overnight in the oven and come back in the morning um, I think this ad is funny I found this Claritin ad like, oh, kill allergens just using a flamethrower. So cold is not microbicidal, it's microbostatic. It doesn't kill, it just pauses them. So think about the fact that we use cold storage to preserve things, like to preserve embryos or preserve stem cells that we can preserve really indefinitely at these cold temperatures. So cryo preservation cold preservation it does it keeps cells frozen in a static state they're still alive but they're just not actively reproducing but they can be thawed and begin to reproduce again um, so we actually use we do use cold as a microbostatic we use it every day when we put our milk back in the refrigerator when we keep food in the refrigerator the whole purpose of that is to slow the spoiling of the food usually due to slowing microbial growth fungi bacteria um, another thing that actually preserves bacteria is drying them out dehydrating them or desiccating desiccation is just another word for dehydrating um, cells need water to grow and if you take their water they can't grow but they also won't die necessarily they just can't reproduce and then you give them back water and they can it's kind of like seeds especially endospore bacteria. Um, so desiccation um, can be a way to actually, uh, it, it is microbostatic, but it's not always microbicidal. Um, and then lyophilization is a combination of the two. It's freeze drying of cells. And when um, microbiology instructors order microbes from a, like a lab company so that we can grow those microbes in lab we order them usually lyophilized so we just get like a little bit of bacteria powder in a tube a lot of probiotics contain lyophilized bacteria when you're taking a pill that contains a bunch of bacteria in it like a little capsule that's lyophilized freeze-dried bacteria um, and it actually preserves them and then they can often be preserved at room temperature too uh, another method of 
physical method of control is radiation. Um, so there's different types of radiation that are different wavelengths along the electromagnetic spectrum. I don't know where I want to put my face. I'm going to put it down here. Okay, so this is the electromagnetic spectrum here. Um, radio waves are very long waves, and then they get shorter and shorter and shorter. If somewhere in the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have the visible light spectrum. So these are the, this is the spectrum of the, the the wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see. So it's really a very small uh, region. And then beyond that, as we get shorter and shorter wavelengths, these are the um, wavelengths I'm talking about, okay, we get into the UV, X-ray, and gamma ray range. So as we move left along the spectrum, we get increasing amounts of energy. And um, these higher energy waves are damaging to cells. So they, the thing they damage specifically is cellular DNA. So UV radiation um, causes a specific type of damage to DNA. It causes the formation of what are called thymine dimers or thymidine dimers. So in a sequence of DNA, any spot where there's two T's next to each other in the code, um, those when exposed to UV radiation, it causes those two T's to stick together. We call that uh, when two, two molecules um, are conjoined, they're called dimers. And these thymidine dimers you can see cause a bit of a kink. They disrupt the base pairing right there, and they can disrupt the ability of DNA polymerase to read the DNA properly and properly replicate it, and also for RNA polymerase to properly read and transcribe it. So that's how UV damages DNA. Um, Ionizing radiation, X-rays and gamma rays fall into ionizing radiation. They can actually cause free radicals that break the DNA. They actually break the sugar phosphate backbone and um, can, can cause DNA breaks that can damage DNA. So that's why you have to wear like a lead vest when you go in for an X-ray. Lead blocks the X-rays because you don't want your reproductive cells in particular to be exposed to um, X-ray radiation because it could affect the DNA in those cells. It can affect the DNA in any of the cells that are exposed to X-rays, which is why there's sort of a limit to the amount of X-rays that one should be exposed to in their lifetime. I read a book a couple years ago about a girl who was sick because it was like in the 19, I don't know, early 1900s. And she had been a child and she'd swallowed a toy or something. And x-rays were like super new. And so, and she was like really rich. And so they had a doctor come and do an x-ray to see this toy inside her. But at the time they really, they didn't know about the damage that x-rays could cause so they actually like gave her a really high dose of radiation and then she had all of these these like maladies for the rest of her life because it really damaged her immune system um but now we know better and so now those things are monitored to reduce so getting you know an x-ray of your broken arm pretty low risk but you don't want to have to be having lots and lots of x-rays throughout your life and x-ray techs definitely wear protective um, clothing and stand behind protective barriers because again this type of radiation is damaging but it does also damage microbes so we can use it to sterilize things and gamma and radiation is actually used in the food industry a lot to sterilize foods um, because it doesn't cook them but it sterilizes as well as heat. Um, and it also doesn't make the food radioactive. So those rays pass through things. So they don't like imbibe a material with radioactivity. They're just rays that pass through. All right, another way that we can sterilize things is through filtration. So we use filters that have very tiny pores, so small that microbes can't fit through them. This technique is used a lot in laboratory settings, like when preparing solutions to use in culture. Like um, I used to work in a lab that studied um, a virus, and so we worked with cell culture. We, we cultured human 
cervical cells. And so when we were preparing buffers and things to take care of our cells and grow our cells, we always had to filter them to make sure that there was no contamination, that we had sterile, you know, broth to feed to our cells that didn't have any bacteria or viruses in it. Um, we couldn't heat sterilize it because there were proteins and stuff in that, in that um, liquid that we didn't want to destroy with the heat. And so we had to filter it to sterilize it. Um, a lot of uh, pharmaceuticals are filtered, vaccines, all right, a lot of times those are filtered um, because, again, if you were to heat them, you would destroy elements that are necessary. Um, air can also be filtered, of course. HEPA filters are really high efficiency filters for, for air systems, trapping particles. So another way that we can control the growth of microbes is by controlling osmotic pressure, by increasing the osmotic pressure of the environment, um, by ramping up the concentration uh, and making it into a hypertonic situation for bacteria. So long in use in throughout history, even before we knew about the existence of microbes, people used salt and sugar to help um, Food, prevent food from spoiling. Fruits oftentimes were sugared and turned into jams or jellies, and meats were salted and dried, so we used dehydration as well, in order to preserve meat, which would spoil very quickly without that. And so what it does is it basically just makes those things an unfriendly environment for microbes to grow because it dehydrates them. It's not that no microbes can grow there, but it does make it very difficult for them to grow there. Um, when it comes to antiseptics or disinfectants that are in liquid form, if they are liquid with a water base, if they're water based, we say that they are aqueous solutions. If they are alcohol based, they're called tinctures. So my tincture story is when I was in college in St. Louis, Missouri, I lived in an apartment, a really old building, and it happened to be infested with spiders and not just any spiders, but brown recluse spiders, which are one of only two venomous spiders in North America. And um, I got bit in my sleep one night on the back of my leg. And um, I went to the went to the campus clinic and, you know, they gave me some broad, broad spectrum antibiotics. And I told my mom, I have this brown recluse bite. Don't worry. I went to the doctor. And she, of course, worried and went on Google and saw all these scary images of people with like giant craters and staph infections, and she found some homeopathic kit. It was basically just activated charcoal powder and grain alcohol, and you were supposed to mix it together and make a, like a black paste and put it on the bite, and it was supposed to like draw out the toxin. Um, and so she sent that to me. So she, she insisted I use this tincture. It was grain alcohol mixed with uh, activated charcoal. So um, when we talk about things that are germicides, we can rank them as high level or low level or intermediate, which basically just tells us the, the level of killing ability of these things. So I don't think I need to define those for you. <clears throat> Um, this is probably a useless slide because it kind of just reiterates what I already talked about sort of in the beginning when we, we talked about some of the things that affect um, the effectiveness of a germicidal agent. You need to know what the nature of the microbe is. You need to make sure that you're choosing the right agent for the material you're treating. Um, you need to vary the exposure time based on what the chemical agent is how contaminated the surface is, and so on and so forth. So those are all things to like really take into consideration if you're treating a, you know, a biological spill um, or a, a surface. 
So here is a, we're going to go through a list or a table of different chemical sterilizing agents. So um, in this first group here, we have a bunch of things that they work by denaturing proteins. They disrupt proteins, um, kind of like heat does, but it's a chemical way to do that. And so things like bleach solutions, bleach works by uh, denaturing proteins. So bleach can kill bacteria, which have proteins in their membrane and, you know, rely on proteins for cellular activities. And they can deactivate viruses, which have proteins in their capsid. So you destroy their capsid and they fall apart. Um, iodine solutions also destroy proteins and they are more mild in terms of the reactions on your skin. So um, using a 2% solution is safe for skin, but a higher percentage solution can be used for surgical tools. Iodine is a brown color, and so it can stain. So a lot of times it's not the, um, like you wouldn't use iodine to clean your floors or countertops probably because it would leave behind a brown residue. So chlorine is oftentimes the the agent of choice for cleaning surfaces, but iodine might be used to clean things like tools instead of bleach. Um, aldehydes and like formaldehyde are particularly toxic, so they're used really infrequently nowadays. They were more common, I don't know, 50, 100 years ago, uh, but since they're, they're fairly toxic to be around, these are usually not the agents of choice. Um, but you, you will still see small amounts of formaldehyde can be used as a preservative agent. In small quantities, it's not so bad, but we wouldn't want to be like spraying surfaces down with, with formaldehyde. Hydrogen peroxide can um, be a good disinfectant. It um, forms oxygen-free radicals that cause oxidative damage. So it's sometimes used in a uh, dilute solution of 3% hydrogen peroxide is what you can buy at the pharmacy. And you can use that on your skin, like on cuts, to help disinfect cuts. And you see it bubbling when you add it to cuts. That's the uh, oxygen that's being produced. Um, higher percentages can be used for sterilizing surgical tools. Ethylene oxide gas is a gas that damages DNA and proteins, and it can be used, it's used a lot in plastics, sterilization of plastics, you just shove them all in a chamber and you, you know, um, let the gas in, let them sit in that gas for a while. Um, it's toxic to humans, so it's not often used in um, human settings, like healthcare settings, but there are some hospitals that have ethylene oxide gas, like sterilizing, uh, like chambers, but when you run them, you have to like seal, you have to seal off the chamber, you have to like seal off the room. Like there's like multiple levels of sealing it off and then you have to wait until all of the gas has been removed before people can go in. It's highly toxic to humans. So it's not always of choice, but it's, it's really, you know, it can, as a gas, it can get into all the nooks and crannies and really fully sterilize things that are like plastics and of, you know, weird shape, but maybe you can't, can't, um, are not heat stable, so they can't be heated. Uh, phenol, like you can almost cross that off the list. It's like never used anymore. It's very old school and that's because it's carcinogenic. So it's really not not safe to work with and not safe to ingest or have on your body. So uh, the most common one that's that's used in healthcare is something called chlorhexidine. It's really mild, um, unlike bleach, which can be damaging to the skin. So chlorhexidine is really a con uh, actually popular one at health healthcare level. Like alcohol is one that's very common in everyday life. Uh, hand sanitizers, the active ingredient in those is the alcohol. They're somewhere between 70 and 95% alcohol by concentration in order to be effective. If there's not enough alcohol, or even if there's too much alcohol, actually, it's not very work. It doesn't work very well. Detergents 
and soaps. Soaps are a type of detergent. Detergents, all of these, by the way, alcohol and detergents, they work by disrupting cell membranes. So the lipid bilayer. And I have a, an image of how they do that coming up. Other things that can be disinfecting agents are heavy metal compounds like mercury and silver have antimicrobial properties. They also are not all that healthy for us, so we tend not to use them in products. Um, mercurochrome, pictured here, is a, uh, a um, I, just, I think it was used up until like the 80s or 90s actually. Um, but it was like a cream that contained mercury and you'd use it as like a disinfectant, like a neosporin kind of a thing, like a topical, it was just like a topical antisepsis cream, but it contained mercury, so not the safest. Um, mercury and silver are all, and some other have, and lead are sometimes used in cosmetics to help keep them microbe free. Um, I know colloidal silver is like a big thing in like the homeopathic world, which also can be have toxicity effects, but it can have antimicrobial effects. Um, so not the best, not not the best options most of the time. All right, so those those detergents. I was saying they disrupt the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. This is what detergents do. So detergents are what in chemistry we call surfactants, or I guess in biochemistry. And a surfactant is anything that disrupts a membrane. And so that's how detergents and soaps work. They are surfactants, they are membrane disruptors, so they just kind of embed themselves in the cell membrane. And when there's a lot of them embedded, they disrupt it enough to like disintegrate it and stuff starts, they basically just burst. Um, this is just a reminder of what denaturation looks like. So a protein in its native state here, it's folded up in its correct three-dimensional shape. All right, and so it fits the substrate here, or I guess another substrate here potentially. Um, and things that disrupt proteins, usually what they do is denature them, cause them to unfold. And if they unfold, they obviously can't bind substrate and do their job or it might cause them to fold into a different shape and which still is they're not able to do their job if they're not in the correct shape and then sometimes agents can just just bind to the pro, to the enzyme bind to the protein and then prevent it from working cuz just the active sites are blocked so those are all different ways that these agents can um, inhibit proteins the heavy metals tend to block active sites and um, the things like Clorox denature the proteins like that. There's other things that can have antimicrobial effect. Dyes, there are actual dyes. The, one of the first antibiotics, um, actually the first antibiotic. So penicillin was, penicillin we'll see, gets credit for being the first one discovered but it took a lot of years before it was actually on the market and available for human use. Um, and so in that time period, another antibiotic was discovered in Germany and it was basically, a, it was Bayer, the company Bayer was studying dyes. And so it was um, an azo dye that had antimicrobial activity. And you can still take this azo dye if you have a urinary tract infection. Um, it's, it's also a, a urinary analgesic, but it is a dye. It's like a bright red orange dye. And so it turns your pee like a bright orange color. So that's a fun side effect. So these dyes, because they are dyes, um, are often not used as antimicrobial agents because, you know, unless you want the side effect of staining something. Um, acids and bases are also good sterilizing agents, but also harmful and caustic to humans and our skin. So we don't t use them that much, but we do use them actually, um, making a, f like in foods, um, very acidic foods are not great environments for bacteria to grow. So like 
adding citric acid or ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid, by the way, is also known as vitamin C. Vitamin C is an acid. And so um, like applesauce, you buy applesauce and usually it has one of these two things added to it to help preserve the applesauce and just prevent growth. Um, <clears throat> so that is a place where we do use acid. And that is the end of this lecture.